Jaron Voss, manager of architectural solutions team at Pella Corporation for 16 years. He's been around the window block, so to speak. And so Pella, for those of you who might not know, is one of uh, the nation's top manufacturer of windows, residentially, and they have commercial applications as well. And Mr. Voss leverages his education in construction and engineering as a leader of Pella's team of architects, engineers, and technicians. And these experts are responsible for solving administration applications, which Pella customers are especially appreciative of. Because the introduction of windows into an opaque wall, is, although it's a really desirable thing to do, is not without its problems as related to performance and durability. So what we're going to learn today is how we go about doing that properly. What are the solutions and strategies? So, Mr. Voss. It's Jaron Voss. Um, I manage our architectural solutions team at Pella Corporation. I have a background in construction engineering. Has anybody ever heard of Iowa State University? Okay, that's more nods than I thought I would get way out here in Massachusetts. So not a very successful sports program, except maybe basketball at Iowa State, but a very well-known engineering program and one of the best construction engineering programs in the country, at least I think. So um, it was really uh, cool to see what you guys are doing here. Um, Fascinated by the tour that Dr. Fiocchi gave and the beautiful facility that you have here. Um, I hope that you're getting the opportunity through your education to get a lot of hands-on experience. Uh, in high school and college, I worked laying brick and block and pouring concrete and framing houses. How many of you have ever framed a wall? Good. How many have ever installed a window? Oh, about as many. Well, that's, that's fantastic. So um, today I'm going to talk about... Uh, the subject that you see up on the screen, that is installing windows and doors into exterior insulated walls. And as Dr. Fiocchi was bringing me around, we saw a lot of wall mock-ups. And essentially every one of them had insulation to the exterior of the framed wall. And I don't know, 10 years ago or so, it would have been pretty rare to see that. Now you see it all the time. So we'll talk about why that is, which really should be 101 level material for you guys and then we'll get into some of the different strategies and solutions that window manufacturers are developing, and of course architects and design professionals are coming up with them as well. So let's, uh, let's get started. As I said, this is a, um, a course that's registered with the AIA, so if you need credits, you can get that. It's also copyrighted. I have to go through those slides every time. So our well, learning objectives today. We're gonna to identify the benefits of exterior insulation wall assemblies, which I said you guys would know off the top of your heads probably. And then we're going to talk about um, the requirements of all window installation systems, and there's a lot of things we could get into with that, but we're going to break it down into three major imperatives. And then we're going to talk about variations in exterior wall assemblies. A lot of the slides are around some of the variations I see in commercial buildings regularly, but they do apply to residential construction as well. And then we're going to talk about, as I said, options for installing windows and doors in exterior insulated walls. And I think you're going to be surprised at some of the variations there are and some of the different solutions uh, that are available. So let's get into this, and I really appreciate audience interaction and questions. So this is the first opportunity for that. Um, why are we putting insulation on the exterior of our framed walls? Anybody? Yes? So thermal, heat loss, heat transfer. All right, that's one. Others? Dr. Fiocchi said you guys would be quiet. I was hoping to prove him wrong. It looks like he has won out. So thermal is the major reason. We'll get into some of the kind of building science reasons for that. Another one that you um, might not think about right off the bat, but we think about a lot in commercial construction, is actually sound attenuation. So you add insulation to the outside of a wall, and you can um, reduce the sound transmission through the assembly. And that's important because a lot of cities and where especially where they're doing construction and revitalization around airports. They want good sound attenuation. Anything else? Other reasons? Okay, well, let's step back a little bit and talk about really what the building envelope needs to do. So the building envelope, a lot of these things are kind of obvious, but the building envelope 
uh, first of all, is your aesthetic palette, right? It's, you want the building to look a certain way, you, that's the facade, right? Uh, what else does a building envelope do? Rain screen, so it has to manage moisture. That's right. It also might be structural. Now, most of the time, we clad the building with something that will protect the structure, uh, but it could be structural in the case of masonry or uh, precast or tilt-up concrete, those kind of construction methods, it might be structural. But really, primarily, um, other than aesthetic, it has all kinds of durability goals. Um, we have to manage water. We have to also have to manage water vapor, which is a little bit different, something that I'll talk about at a very high level. We have to control airflow, and we have to control heat flow. Um, and I, I mentioned sound earlier. We also need to control sound. Occupants of buildings, they want to be comfortable, and they want to be able to hear themselves thick, think and hear a speaker, you know, like myself. So um, those are just some of the, uh, the goals of building envelope. So we don't accomplish all those goals the same way we have in the past, right? Building construction has changed a lot in the last, well, you know, pick your time frame. Let's, let's say 80 or 100 years. We used to build a lot of buildings with masonry. Uh, so the really rough, simple graphic up here is a multi-width brick wall. So you see a lot of old commercial buildings uh, in old, old parts of downtown cities built this way. You see a lot of old higher-end homes built this way. Um, brick, of course, was very durable. It's already UV resistant. It already... Um, you can do a lot of things with it aesthetically, though not as much as we do with a lot of other materials now. Um, very durable in and of itself, and it's also structural. Uh, but let's talk about how it manages the elements and uh, achieve some of those goals that we talked about on the last slide. So um, bulk moisture from precipitation, most of that is going to just you know, be shed at the exterior, but you're going to be surprised by how much moisture that masonry absorbs, either through cracks or through the mortar or just because brick and masonry is just porous to begin with. So if you don't coat it with anything that resists moisture, it's going to absorb it. Absorb it. Uh, it's also going to absorb moisture just through uh, water vapor. And there's a couple ways that happens. Again, we're not going to get real deep into the science of it, but um, first of all, everything likes to seek an, equili seek an equilibrium, right? Hot and cold, also dry and moist. So if your wall is uh, dry, and your air is humid, if there's no moisture uh, or vapor retarder or vapor barrier, then that vapor is going to get absorbed into the wall. It's going to reach an equilibrium. Well, there's another thing that happens. It's called vapor drive. When there is heat, that drives uh, vapor really away from the heat uh, is a simple way to think about that. And so if you have hot, humid conditions outside, you have a drier wall, well, moisture vapor is going to come into the wall as well. And that can also happen from, happen from the interior. If you have a drier wall, you have a moist, a moist condition at the interior, you have um, heating at the interior of the building, that can drive uh, vapor into the wall from the interior as well. So you can have moisture loading from both sides uh, is the key thing to remember there. Well, a masonry wall is very durable against moisture. It can handle it. It can be very wet and not fail. It doesn't rot. Um, there's things like efflorescence, but for the most part, that masonry wall is not going to fail. And what's going to happen is it's going to hold the wall uh, and act as a reservoir until a drying condition exists. And then that moisture is going to uh, escape and, again, try to reach, reach an equilibrium. And that moisture is going to go to the air at the outside or also to the air at the inside. So a masonry wall with no vapor barrier, um, not covered with any coatings that will prevent vapor transfer, can dry to both sides. So it really has a lot of drying potential. It doesn't necessarily dry out, dry out fast because it's thick, and there's a lot of mass there, but it can dry both directions. So we don't really build this way very often anymore. Why? Yes, sir. Yep, perfect. It is thermally inefficient, but it's also very labor intensive and very expensive from a material standpoint. And it's heavy. You can only build so high with a multi-width masonry wall, right? So we need lighter, 
uh, strategies. We need more, uh, less labor-intensive strategies in order to build um, today. So again, very, very basic cross-section here of a framed wall. Uh, so forgive the basicness of it, but as I said before, this is a 101 level course <laughs> in uh, building science. So let's talk about how we um, manage moisture in a framed wall. So we, we still have bulk water to deal with. We try to shed most of that at the siding, but the siding's imperfect, so it's going to get back uh, into the sheathing and into the stud cavity potentially if we don't do anything about that. Moisture vapor can still act on the wall if there's no vapor retarder, both from the exterior and the interior. And uh, at least in this assembly, there's nothing really to prevent drying. Uh, so really all the same things are going to happen if we don't do anything to manage that water, except that now we have moisture-sensitive materials that cannot stand to be wet. Uh, they need to stay dry. So what do we do? Well, we add, vapor, we add water barriers. Uh, I'm going to use the um, abbreviation WRB to speak about that uh, today, but some type of uh, drainage plane, I'm sure your, uh, your professors and your courses use different terms to describe this, but we're going to use a, a water-resistive barrier to stop bulk moisture, at least what gets past the siding, and we try to limit that most of the time. Uh, but water vapor can still get through if that isn't also a vapor retarder or vapor barrier. Now, in cold climates, in order to make these walls perform better, we started to add vapor barriers on the interior because we realized those walls were getting wet uh, and absorbing um, water vapor from the interior. But what does that do? It stops uh, water vapor, but it also prevents drying to the interior. So we've got drying to the exterior, at least to the exterior of the siding. We no longer have drying to the interior. So while we've stopped some of the, some of the wetting of the wall, we've also reduced some of the drying of the wall. All right, so the advantages of moving away from masonry to stud walls was we, we increased our thermal efficiency, we decreased our labor, we decreased our material costs, but we have a lot of things to think about in terms of uh, water control. So how do we improve this? Well, one of the things that we started doing was adding an airspace behind the cladding, right? So now we've increased our drying potential. Um, we're still managing water. And oh, by the way, we can also add a vapor control element to our water resistive barrier. So we can really prevent uh, vapor, at least the, the amount we want, from getting into the wall from the exterior. Uh, we remove that interior vapor barrier because we realize we want more drying to the inside. So, but now we're letting that vapor get in there. And as I said before, we've increased our drying potential at the exterior. We have drying potential at the interior. Does anybody know what this wall is at risk of now? I think I saw you say it. Condensation, exactly. So now that sheathing is cold, and uh, we've allowed it to at least get some uh, moisture from the interior. Now, that's kind of situational, how much moisture is going to be in there, depending on um, how the building is heated, mostly, but also what the building is used for. So now we have a situation where we have a condensation risk at the backside of the sheathing. So how do we fix that? Well, we add insulation to the exterior of the wall. And we can do our um, air, water, and vapor control layer either to the exterior or behind uh, the foam board insulation, depending on what system we use. And now we're still managing our, our precipitation. We're managing our vapor uh, from the exterior. We're letting our uh, water vapor get in there from the interior, but we're also allowing it to dry. And of course, as I mentioned, we've reduced our condensation potential. But what do we add back? We added back quite a bit of cost and labor and some complexity too. But sometimes those are the trade-offs that we make to have a wall that's sound uh, and to gain a lot of thermal efficiency. And uh, I don't know if this information might actually be a little bit out of date, but um, because of the soundness of this and trying to build uh, properly and trying to increase the thermal performance of our uh, built environment, this is in the codes now, right? So. As of a few years ago, if you were in climate zones three, four, and five, you could build with two by six construction as a minimum, or if you built with two by four construction, you had to put an inch of rigid insulation on the exterior. And then in climate zones six and seven, a little bit north of here, you can do two by four with two inch, or you can do two by six with one inch. Now, a lot of the assemblies I saw here today 
went well beyond that. And a lot of construction does go beyond that. There's programs like Passive House and LEED, and there's many other programs um, that promote a lot higher uh, wall R values and a lot better assemblies than the code minimums. But we see a lot of walls um, built at this minimum or even below it where there's no or little code enforcement or where adoption is lacking. Um, I built my house uh, almost a decade ago in South Central Iowa in Climate Zone 5. And I used exterior insulation on my walls just because I knew it was good, not because there was any code enforcement uh, of any sort. And I'll talk about a little bit the strategy that I used that I thought was a, a pretty efficient way to do it. Uh, so let's transition a little bit into uh, window and door installation. As a number of you had installed windows and doors before, so why do we even put windows and doors uh, in buildings? I know there's some folks that kind of question that because glass is less thermally efficient than uh, the rest of the wall assembly. And if your primary goal is thermal efficiency, then you want less glass, right? So why do we, why do we even use fenestration? Yes? People like the views, absolutely. And they like the light, right? We love the light, we love the views, uh, but then once we introduce uh, a window into the building, now we've got a lot of problems we need to solve. First of all, we need to integrate it into the wall. Um, we need to manage moisture. It needs to withstand wind loads, uh, all those things. And uh, so there's a lot of ways we could go with this. I'm going to break down window installation for purposes of this presentation into three imperatives. We have to make sure to install a window properly that we've got structural support of the window. That is, that it's held in place. Structural attachment uh, of the window. Um, and so to, to contrast that from structural support, I mean attachment versus wind load. So I'm talking about in or out of the wall with structural attachment. For structural support, I'm talking about really the weight of the window. And then integration with the, the water resistive barrier or at least the moisture strategy, moisture control strategy of the building. Okay, so we're just, there's a lot of things we can talk about. We're just going to talk about those three in regards to uh, window installation. So conventional um, stud-framed wall with a nailing flange window. This happens to be a fiberglass sliding window that you see uh, in the cross section. Uh, we get our structural support because we are within the framed wall, right? So the window is held up by the framed wall. We get our uh, structural attachment by putting a fastener through a nailing flange and our water resistive barrier integration, again, this is, this is really basic, is just really done by watershed overlap of the nailing fin with the water resistive barrier, right? Pretty basic. But there is one element of structural support I want to talk about that folks don't usually think about. When we rate windows and doors for code compliance, we have to do structural wind load testing. And we have to... So obviously that means positive and negative forces on the window frame. And when you put a positive or negative force on the glass and on the sash, that's going to push on the frame. And depending on how you've supported the frame, that's going to create a rotational force of the frame. And that sash or glass, depending on if you're putting positive load on it or negative load on it, that sash might want to come out to the exterior under negative load or fly to the interior on positive load if you don't do anything to resist that frame twisting. Does that make sense? And actually the highest loads we have to test for with windows and doors is negative. Um, that's because at the corners of the building, the wind has to speed up. And when the wind speeds up and goes around the corner, it creates turbulence and that creates negative or suction forces uh, on the wall. So the highest forces are actually negative which again is going to create a rotational force um, to the exterior on most products. But we also have to think about that rotational force to the interior. So that's going to be important as we add foam board and talk about the uh, pros and cons and strategies. So if we start to add some insulation, and I'm going to start with the basics here. If we were just to add a half an inch or three quarters of an inch insulation, I know this isn't code minimum, really, but there are also performance paths to complying with the code where you can make trade-offs and you can do other greater energy efficiency things in one area and lesser energy efficient things in another area and still comply. So this is a good place to start. Um, if you're using half inch or three quarters inch insulation, um, that is thinner 
than most windows project to the exterior. I've got a sample up here. I'm going to use some. But you can see this window. This is its nailing flange right here. The frame projects to the exterior about an inch and a quarter. That's pretty standard. Most windows or doors project about that far to the exterior. So if I had half an inch thick rigid insulation, I could put it to the exterior of the nail fin if I wanted to, really just like it was a piece of siding, and I could put some more siding over the top of that. I could attach through it, really by just using a little bit longer nail or screw, depending on what I'm doing, and I wouldn't change anything else about the install, right? Even at three quarters of an inch, I could still probably do that. The, the key thing would be I need to still have some overlap of my siding and my window frame so that I can do an exterior seal. Why would I do an exterior seal? Because I want to keep a whole bunch of water from pouring into the wall. Right? If you have, even if you have a 30 seconds of an inch crack between your perimeter trim or your siding and your window frame, multiply that times the linear feet times the number of window frames around the building and see what kind of a hole you've just put in your building. So we always put sealant between the window frame and the siding, except in some rain screen scenarios, which is, I'm not going to talk about today. But anyway, you want to make sure you have an overlap of your, uh, your window frame and your siding. So as you thicken your insulation, eventually you're not going to be able to put it to the exterior of the, of the fin or the nailing flange and leave the window back here. Everybody tracking with me so far on that? Good. Okay, so we, our three imperatives, structural attachment, uh, integration with the weather resistive barrier, and structural support, we're really doing these exactly the same way we did in the conventional install because in the case of just half inch or three quarter inch insulation, we haven't really changed anything. The window is still in the same place. The insulation board is just like a piece of siding. All right, so now we go up to an inch. Now I probably need to move my nailing fin and my window to the exterior of the insulation because at about an inch or so, I'm not gonna have that overlap between uh, the siding and the window frame. And most manufacturers will allow you to install the window over top of an inch of foam board without having to do anything different because the window still overlaps onto the framed wall. Everybody see that from the, from the slide? That window's overlapping uh, the framed wall enough that it's supported. So I've got my structural attachment just by uh, lengthening my fastener through the nailing flange. I've got my integration with the weather resistive barrier in the same way, at least in this case because it's on the exterior of the foam board. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And I've got my structural support because I'm still uh, overlapped enough into the wall. So when the problems really come in is when you exceed an inch in insulation thickness. All right? So if I were to put my window out on the exterior surface of the foam board now, uh, I could just lengthen my fastener. I'd probably be okay. I can integrate with the weather resistive barrier if my WRB is to the exterior of the foam board, but I can't necessarily support the window. Now, I might be able to support it uh, just from a weight standpoint, and I know there's been testing done in the industry on that, and I've seen some of that testing and talked to some of those folks. But the problem with that is it doesn't take into account the rotational forces on the window frame from positive and negative wind loading. But as soon as you just hang a window out on the foam board, that label on the window that says it complies with code in your area for wind pressures, that's no longer true because you've just put it in a condition it wasn't tested for. So now it might fail structurally. And that's really the primary thing that the code actually cares about with respect to windows and doors other than thermal performance is life safety, right? That that window does not come out of the building uh, in some type of a bad uh, weather event. Okay, so this is where uh, all the solutions and all the hand wringing comes in in the industry is how do we handle this condition where we want to we put a lot of insulation outside of the building. How do we install the windows? And oh, by the way, how do you install the siding? Because now um, I was going to mention back here, the reason I, I built my house with two by six walls and three quarters of an inch rigid insulation to the exterior of my nailing fin was because I could just attach my fiber cement siding right through the insulation and the sheathing and into the studs with a regular two and a half inch siding nail and a regular pneumatic siding nailer. As soon as you get beyond that, now you have to do furring or something, or you have to do something that you have to um, drive by hand, not with the pneumatic gun. So there's a lot of labor things to think about as you increase your insulation thickness not just around window installation, but also around siding. 
So uh, if I could have talked to the folks who were writing the codes several years back, I'd have said, please consider three quarters of an inch as your minimum instead of an inch as your minimum because of all of the dominoes that fall once you get past three quarters of an inch. Three quarters of an inch is that threshold where you can't, you can no longer attach fiber cement siding or, um, I don't know about vinyl siding. Not many people are using that anymore. Um, but anyway, I was a big fan of three quarters of an inch because of how it simplified the rest of the construction of the home. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about solutions really for thicker insulated walls. And I'm not even gonna go into some of the really thick exterior insulated walls, but really some of the more common things that I see um, uh, in the industry. We're gonna talk about the use of blocking, which is real basic. We're gonna talk about metal trim, but really, while it says metal, you can really do it out of a lot of different uh, trim materials. Then I'm gonna talk about exterior frame extensions, uh, receptors, which is sort of a different installation method, and then support brackets which is uh, something you might not have seen before. So let's get into some project examples. This is a 16 or 17 story building in Minneapolis. Had fiberglass windows installed in it. Uh, you, they used a nailing fin installation. And the weather resistive barrier was to the exterior of the foam board. This actually used a tape joint um, system. So the, the surface of the foam board is also the water control layer. And so the joints were taped. Here's the architectural detail. Uh, and a photo of, uh, of an installed window. You can see, uh, as I mentioned, let's give this thing a try. As I mentioned, the water control layer is the dash line there. It's on the exterior of the, of the foam board. We've got, we've got brick veneer uh, with a lintel. In this case, they called for um, multiple layers of plywood for some reason for the blocking. Not my call, but that's what they wanted to do. And you can see the window is uh, installed there to the exterior uh, of the foam board wall. And the reason that really needs to be the case, uh, or at least it's the, the simplest way to do it, is wherever your weather resistive barrier is, that's really where your nailing flange needs to be. And I'll show you uh, some of the downsides to not doing that here in a moment. Uh, so this is the, the window manufacturer shop drawing. You can see we're getting structural support from the blocking. We're getting our structural attachment right into the, uh, the layers of plywood, and those, of course, are attached back to the wall. And then we've integrated with the weather resistive barrier um, right there at the surface of the nailing fin in normal watershed overlap fashion. Okay, so that's one way of doing blocking. Multiple layers of plywood, which, by the way, I've maybe only seen one or once or twice after that. Typically, we see blocking to, used to support windows in one of these two ways, and there's some pros and cons to these. Uh, the one on your left um, uses less blocking than the one on the right. So we've got a little bit less expense in terms of blocking, but it also removes more insulation. So the insulation has now uh, been cut back more. So then what we, we've reintroduced the same uh, thermal bridging at the studs that we were trying to get rid of by using the insulation. Does that make sense? Now, the one on the right uses more blocking, but allows the insulation to come further. Uh, towards the wall. Anybody think of another pro or con to uh, option A versus option B here? You still have a thermal bridge in both. That's, that's very true. You also have, uh, there's a couple things here. Uh, with this one, you've got two joints that run all the way from the exterior to the interior. One is on the outside of the blocking, and one is between the window and the blocking. Versus over here, you just have one. That's a downside. Another downside to the method on the right is um, as you're thinking about as you're thinking about actually constructing this and planning for it. Windows have standard sizes often, and standard rough opening sizes based on those sizes. Well, if you're going to put the blocking like this, then and your framed wall is, is done first and then somebody comes back in and puts that blocking around there, now there's extra coordination around, well, how does that size now differ from what I had planned on? Make sense? Because really you're sort of making two rough openings, one before you put the blocking in, one after. So there's a potential for miscommunication there as well, a little bit of extra complexity. But uh, the greatest uh, issue, I think, with blocking is really um, this issue of transitioning the weather resistive barrier. So if I have my weather resistive barrier behind the foam board, which is more common than outside of the foam board, 
at least in the, the projects that I see, but you use blocking and you put your window and your nailing flange to the exterior, now you have to transition that weather resistive barrier. That adds a lot of time and complexity to the install. There's a lot of opportunities for uh, errors and issues with the overlaps, the corners. I mean, think about, particularly if you're using flashing tape, trying to flash those three-dimensional corners. It's very time-consuming uh, and very complicated. Um, now, if you're using a liquid applied weather resistive barrier, then maybe it's not so bad. You just have to make sure you don't miss any, any corners or any, uh, any transitions or geometry with your liquid applied flashing. Uh, but that's a downside to using blocking when you have a system with the weather resistive barrier behind the foam board. Okay, now I'm going to talk about metal trim. And as I said before, it doesn't have to be metal, but you'll see what I mean by the example. This is a five or six story apartment building in Kansas City. And the design called for an inch and a half of rigid insulation and two inch of airspace. There was a lot of different weather resistive barrier systems used on this project, but they were all behind the foam. So uh, the architect drew uh, the window nailing flange shown behind the foam. In this case, it's a vinyl window. The architect had drawn a, uh, a double hung or sliding window cross section there. And what actually ended up being used in the project was fixed windows uh, with awnings below them. So you'll see the cross section here in a moment looks different. Um, but the, the key thing to keep in mind here is right here, this little L-shaped line that's very thin. That's really just a rough opening perimeter closure piece. You can see it in the photo right here. And it's just basically bridging out that gap that you would have uh, where the brick stops and the insulation and the window uh, sort of begin there. So the window manufacturer shop drawing looked like this. And the nailing flange is uh, back behind the foam board where the weather resistive barrier is. And because we held our window back, we got our structural support from the wall, as we normally would. We got our structural attachment into the wall through the nailing flange. And we're able to integrate with the weather resistive barrier in normal fashion. And then we're also relying on that metal trim to uh, prevent bulk water from getting in behind the brick as well. Pros and cons to this approach that you can think of? Anybody? Well, we, we reintroduced a little bit of a thermal bridge with this metal trim, right? Because metal is a conductor. <clears throat> and that metal goes from the exterior all the way back behind the foam board to the sheeting. Okay? That's one downside. Another downside is we have uh, two sealant joints that we need to have. Although the, the cross-section drawing doesn't show it, you can see from the photo that we have a joint between the window frame and the trim and another joint between the trim and the masonry. And if we don't seal up both of those, we'll have bulk water in the wall. And maybe we're okay with that, but we better make sure that our, our wall's drainage system can handle a lot of water, because this is a, like a five or six story building, right? That's a lot of water. So I would say you need to seal that some way, shape, or form. Uh, and then, of course, there was more trim applied here at the sill later on that just wasn't installed at the time of the photo. Now, if you were doing a fiber cement or a wood-sided building, maybe it's, a, maybe it's residential, you probably wouldn't use metal trim here, though you could. You might use a wood return trim or maybe an expanded PVC return trim like ASIC or Fipon or one of the other manufacturers of expanded PVC. And I saw some of your, uh, your wall mock-ups here in the building uh, constructed that way. Uh, but in commercial construction, I don't often see um, that method used. It's more commonly some type of a metal trim, some type of painted metal trim. All right, let's move on to uh, a couple of variations of uh, frame extensions. And these are starting to become a little bit more common, particularly in commercial construction. Uh, in this case, uh, the extension was supplied by the window, ma window manufacturer, and it was applied to the window frames before they were installed. So you can see from the photo that we've got this, this deep projection coming off of the window frame. The weather resistive barrier is not on the building yet, but there's been some, some flashing um, pre-applied to the window or to the window frame. I'm not sure which the situation was here. So these were pre-applied exterior frame extensions. And this, this project had two inches of foam board. Uh, and because there was a number of different wall assemblies, they didn't use a nailing flange attachment method. I'll show you. They used an installation clip attachment method or a strap anchor. Some folks call it the strap anchor installation method so that the window could stay in the same place across different wall variations. 
Okay, so here's the architectural drawings. You can see there um, on your left, there's insulation behind sheathing. And there's some systems you can buy uh, where the insulation board is adhered to the back of the uh, plywood or the sheathing. Uh, you can buy it that way. And then on the right, you see sort of a conventional uh, steel stud framed wall with a gypsum base sheathing and two inches of rigid insulation to the exterior of that. But the windows uh, look the same, even though the wall thickness varies and the wall construction varies. The window's in the same place, so it looks aesthetically the same from the exterior. You can see that the, the setback of the window, the glazing from the wall or from the siding is the same. And the uh, extension design uh, is also exactly the same. So that requires you to not install with nailing fin, but instead to install with this attachment clip that I mentioned earlier. See if I can point it out. So that's this metal. It's a galvanized metal um, clip that's attached to the window frame and then attached to the wall just at several points around the window frame. It's not continuous. And then this extension piece is applied into the window's uh, accessory groove here. And again, it's installed, um, it could be installed after the window is placed, but it's a lot easier to install that on the ground before you raise the window into the opening, especially on a multi-story building like this. So in this case, we've got our structural support because we've held the window back into the wall. We've got our structural attachment through this clip. And then um, we have to do our wires just a barrier integration just a little bit differently. We have to rely more on wall flashings and exterior perimeter sealants because we don't have a nailing flange to um, integrate into, into, the weather into the weather resistive barrier in a shingle lap fashion. Any questions on this? I'm seeing mostly board insulation out there on a lot of rock. Some of both really just dependent upon um, fire codes. We do see more rock wool um, regionally where fire is more important and uh, more often in the cities downtown. Yep. But a, yeah. And rock wool is, rock wool is a great product because it's, uh, it's moisture resistant, it's fire resistant, it's got good insulated properties. Um, it's a little bit different to work with from a weather just a barrier standpoint because, you know, as with some type of foam boards, you can use those as part of your water control strategy, but with rock wool, not quite the same way. So. Yes, and I we see a lot of metal rain screens and also a lot of uh, fiber cement rain screens or fiber cement panel siding systems. It's very common uh, and very popular. Uh, okay, so I mentioned uh, pre-applied exterior frame extension. Now I'll show a project that's got an example of uh, a site installed uh, frame extension actually installed after the windows were, um, were set. Again, this was supplied by the window manufacturer. Uh, but in this case, it was used at the head and sill only, which is a little bit unusual. Um, the wall had two inches of insulation, an inch and a half airspace, and both the window's nailing flange and the weather to barrier were behind the foam. So here's a, a photo of kind of the sill jam condition of a, a typical condition on this project. Uh, and then uh, a fiberglass casement window with this field applied exterior frame extension. And I'll kind of show, in fact, I'll pass this around. But this is an aluminum clad window that works exactly the same way. Um, let's see if I can show this. So this is the portion that would extend to the exterior. This is an unpainted aluminum piece. This part here is gonna go into the accessory groove and then you can attach it to the wall over top of the nailing flange. So it sits on the window frame like this, goes over the top of the nailing fin and then extends to the exterior. Again, this one's unpainted, so it doesn't look that great, but 
That's how it works. I'll pass that around. So that um, succeeded in bridging the cavity and covering over the airspace without requiring the masonry to go all the way back. <coughs> Excuse me. But as we mentioned with metal trim, one of the downsides here is this is a thermal bridge, right? This is an aluminum part. It's going from the exterior behind the foam board, so that's not great. Um, but it's pretty cost effective. Uh, and uh, aesthetically, it um, achieved the goals that um, this project was going for. You can see here that, um, well, let me cover the imperative. So since we held the window back, we have supported the window structurally uh, in the wall. We've attached it to the wall as we normally would. And uh, the only difference with our weather to barrier integration is we're kind of also using this frame extension to keep bulk water out of the wall. Right? Otherwise, our integration of the weather to barrier with the nailing fin is the same as it always is. And I'll show a photo of that here in a minute. This is a photo of the head jam condition. I think maybe that, lint, that galvanized lintel is probably going to get painted at some point, but it wasn't at the time of this photo. And you can see that the uh, frame extension was used again to bridge the cavity, allow that uh, insulation to run all the way to the opening, um, but still be covered uh, so that it isn't exposed. Again, we're attaching uh, normally and we are integrating uh, with the building's water control strategy through uh, watershed overlaps and flashing tapes and also a through wall flashing there above the masonry or in the masonry there at the lintel. And you can see from uh, the photo, the finished photo here that uh, the reason they didn't put that thing on all four sides is because they wanted to see the masonry all the way back to the window at the jam. Just uh, kind of an aesthetic choice, but I think the photo that I showed at the beginning um, I would agree with the choice that they made. It does look nice to, to see that masonry returned like that. It's a little more substantial. Um, but you can see from the other photo that uh, this building used a liquid applied flashing and then uh, some flashing tapes to transition between the window frame over the nailing flange and back to the uh, fluid applied flashing. And it's kind of difficult to see from the photo, but the window is completely integrated uh, into the weather just a barrier and then <laughs> the extension is applied afterwards. So it really doesn't change the strategy of integration, um, but it does help to keep bulk water out of the back of the wall. Yes, sir? Uh, this fluid applied, I'm talking about like a fluid applied weather just a barrier, so a sort of whole building liquid coating is what I'm talking about. Um, I'm not sure how many of those are butyl. Many of them are, some of them are silicone based, some of them are urethane based, some of them are other Modif modifications of chemistry that I don't understand. But that's, uh, I see a lot of fluid applied flashings used in commercial construction. Major downside to doing that in the north is you can't do it in the winter, right? So that's not great. Um, but it is a great um, strategy for having a continuous water control and depending on its properties, vapor control layer around the building. Yes? Um, you're talking about fluid applied flashings, or there are water based and non water based? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's cold, so it doesn't, it doesn't flow very well. There's a lot of other challenges with it. Um, yeah, it's possible to apply these things below freezing, certain ones. There's not very many of them done that way, but it is possible. Yes. Yeah, that's true. You would have to enclose the building if you were putting brick up. So that's that's a good point. Any questions on that? How far has the part made it around? Okay, I do need it back. So when it gets up here, make sure I get it back. All right, here's a, a little bit different approach. This is really using a different installation method. So this, this building, there's an existing four-story building in Chicago, and it's having another four stories added to the top of it. So we have both existing masonry construction, the kind of wall that I showed at the very beginning of the presentation that we don't really do anymore. And then it's got steel stud framing up above with exterior insulation and so on. Um, so 
on the upper floors, we've got two inches of foam board. On the lower floors, we've got multi-width masonry. This is the architectural drawing of the upper floors. Um, how many of you are architecture students? So probably too many of you for me to, to play the old engineer versus architect thing. Also, I'll just let it go. Uh, but anyway, the window manufacturer identified that maybe we could use a common installation method across both the lower floors and the upper floors that would allow the windows to be installed from the interior with no work required at the exterior at all, at least related to the window and door installation. And that is a receptor or a panning installation system. And this is a, a called an L receptor here, obviously, because it's, it's L-shaped. And how that works is uh, this is a painted aluminum part, and it gets attached to the, to the openings at the head and jam. And then a gasket goes into the accessory groove or the exterior part of the window frame. And then there are, again, some metal clips that are used that engage the window frame. And then a screw uh, presses the window via the clip and compresses the gasket against the back of the receptor, holds the window in place against positive and negative forces. So essentially, you could reach around and you could do that exterior perimeter sealant. You can just prep the window in the room, and then you tilt the window in, you compress it into place, and then you go on to the next one. You don't have to go outside to do sealants or anything like that. You can install the window from the inside. And in, in some situations, that's pretty helpful to not have to get these big heavy window combinations out onto a lift or out onto scaffolding or swing staging. Yes? How much deflection Deflection in which way? So the screw, I'll pass this around and you can kind of see, but um, the way it works is I have my window frame. This clip is going to be engaged into this window's groove, and then I'm going to take that clip and I'm going to screw it, and the, the window frame is going to bottom out on this flange before that clip bottoms out on here. So any extra that I drive that screw is going to bend the clip a little bit, and that thing's going to be in there really tight. This, in terms of other type of deflection, this does permit the header to deflect some versus the window. Does that make sense? So this, this receptor could move up or down a little bit with the header and just overlap the window. So it's kind of like a slip joint or a control joint in that way. But that's not really its, its primary goal, isn't really to do that. It's more of a, an installation method that allows you to put the windows in from the interior, that kind of thing. It also overlaps any, you know, windows are joined together uh, oftentimes into two or three or six window unit configurations and you have these joints between the windows that the, the window manufacturer tries to seal up the best they can. The nice thing about this is it acts very much like a flashing except a little bit better in that it really overlaps the top of any of those joints. So it's sort of like uh, having some, some extra flashing across the top of the window assembly. Yeah, so you have, that's another, um, I suppose you could say it's another advantage. Because of the overlap of that flange over the front of the window frame, you can accommodate more rough opening tolerance versus the window frame. And in this case, it would be about three-eighths of an inch, maybe plus or minus a quarter. Um, you have to be careful. At some point, you're going to expose your gasket, and, and it might break down in UV, that kind of thing. But it does allow for some extra tolerance in terms of installation. But you also have to plan for it because your roof openings have to be larger. So you make sure that you would understand that that was going to be the case. So our structural support, or our structural attachment, I guess uh, uh, it's showing, goes from the wall through that receptor, through that clip, and into the window frame. So we make sure we're holding that window in and out versus wind load. Our... Um, Structural support, we got the window back in the wall and kind of in this receptor. Although we can vary the placement of the receptor in and out of the wall somewhat, there's a limit to that. Otherwise, you, you know, can no longer attach it to something. And I'm showing a head detail so you don't see any shims between the window frame and the receptor, but at a jam or at a sill, there would be. Yes, some questions back there? Yeah, 
It well, it it can somewhat allow for deflection or even the multi-story shrinking of wood structures. It, it can do that a little bit, but primarily it's just a way to attach the window where you're installing it from the inside and kind of dry glazing it, so you don't have to go to the exterior and do more work. Another question. Oh yeah, sure. What's being shown in the in the drawing here is an aluminum clad wood window. So here's here's the window frame. Here's the glass. So I've got two panes of glass. There's aluminum extrusion at the exterior and then a wood frame at the interior. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, I mentioned structural support and structural attachment and our uh, integration with the weather resistive strategy of the building. Um, we've got a water control layer to the exterior of the sheathing behind the foam board and we've got a flashing there and then some exterior sealants. A lot of different lines of sealants. I don't have uh, time to go into all that. But we have a thermal break at the interior using low expansion foam between the window frame and the stud wall. So while our, our receptor, wherever that is, um, is aluminum, it goes back into the wall of ways, but it doesn't go back all the way. It is thermally broken versus the interior. Uh, here's a section through the window vertically, uh, head and sill detail uh, at those upper floors from the architectural drawings and then from the window manufacturer shop drawing. And here is one of the lower floors where there's masonry. You can see the installation method uh, is exactly the same across both, the roof opening frame is exactly the same across both, or the, the sizing of the opening versus the window frame is the same across both. And the contractors do not have to take any windows outside of the building to install them. They all come from inside, which is pretty helpful when you're in downtown Chicago trying to build a building. Questions on that before we go on to the next thing? Yes? Pretty often, yep. Usually when we use a nailing flange, um, we use a flexible tape. Um, there are so many different tapes on the market made out of different materials with different pros and cons. Uh, I won't get into that, but yes, when we're using a nailing flange, we are almost always using a flexible flashing tape to integrate it with the building wrap uh, or the weather, weather just a barrier of the building. And of course, there's, there's flexible tape and there's stretchable tape. Um, and yeah, we're using both of those most of the time. Yep. So is Cohen, it's residential install, do they recommend tapes? Or well, Pella actually has its own tape. Uh, Pella has a butyl based, foil faced flashing tape that we've had about, we were a really early adopter of using flashing tapes. Um, you know, back before flashing tapes and Tyvek, everybody just back cocked the nailing fin to the wall. They didn't really watershed overlap things very well. That was kind of a problem. We saw some of those problems happening, so we developed a flashing tape that was uh, butyl based, so it had good uh, low temperature adhesion, was uh, compatible with most materials, didn't start to run at high temperatures like asphalt based tapes, and then also had a foil facing, so it was UV resistant. You could leave this stuff out in the sun for a long time, it doesn't do anything to it. There's a few other tapes like that on the market. Um, well, anyway, we like it, but there's also a lot of stretchable tapes on the market now. Um, that are used at the roof opening sill so that you can just form the tape around the corner. Does Pella have one of those too? Or? We don't have one of those. Um, we're looking at one, um, but we don't have one of those right now. So I want to talk about one more solution um, or strategy to installing windows and foam board, foam board walls um, that is a little bit unique, and that is a support bracket. And I'm going to pass this one around here, and then we also have this model that you can come up and look at later on if you want to. And this photo kind of describes it too. So this is a support bracket. And if you think about a window install, a window, if you're installing it properly, it doesn't need to be supported for its weight continuously because you're supposed to shim a window. In fact, what happens most of the time when people just set a window right on the framing, particularly if it's like a double hung window or a sliding window, is the sill of the window will frown at you at some point which is not good, particularly not good for a double hung or single hung window because you can't get it closed right 
or you can't get the screen in, or some other frustrating thing like that, you're supposed to shim a window under the jams of the window, that is at the sides, and under mullions, where windows are joined together, and maybe a few other places if the manufacturer says to. Depending on if it's vinyl or fiberglass or what, what the window's made out of, it might vary. So you don't need to support the window continuously, you really just need to support it at the shim points. So what if we came up with a solution where we just supported it well at the shim points and saved ourselves a lot of cost and a lot of effort by just supporting it where it needed to be supported? Well, that's the idea for the support bracket. Uh, the support bracket sticks out uh, into the foam board and kind of acts as a cantilevered support for that point where you're going to shim. So you need to put one of these support brackets at your shimming points. You just kind of press it down into the foam board and then it acts as sort of a cantilever and you attach it back to the wall. And uh, in this case, this particular design works with an inch and a half or two inch rigid insulation. And uh, again, here's a cross section sort of through where that support bracket would be. You can see that the, the structural support of the window is done by shimming at the point of the bracket. And then that bracket transfer, transfers that load back into the framed wall. So the window could be set out um, and still supported on that thick foam board. Because remember I said at the beginning, we have to support our window against these rotational forces that the wind is putting on the window. Uh, so therefore, our support bracket does that. One other thing, though, that you need to keep in mind is, really, if in order for this to work or to make sense, we have moved the the building wrap or the weather distant barrier or whatever you want to call it to the exterior of the foam board because where your nailing fin is, that's really where your weather distant barrier should be. At least that's the simplest place to put it because now you don't have to transition it. So that's something to keep in mind. And we can do our structural attachment just by lengthening our fastener and we can do our, our water control, our weather distant barrier integration the same way we normally would if we kept it in plane with the nailing fin. So here's some illustrations that kind of show uh, a little bit more detail how that might work. So let's say we're using a foam board that has a taped joint system. So in other words, there's no extra wrap we're putting over top of this. We're taping the joints of the insulation to serve as our water barrier. Uh, in this case, you would tape that any joints coming into the bottom of the window frame because we're going to do everything in watershed overlap fashion, everything from bottom to top. We're setting some support brackets where the window needs to be supported at the bottom, right? Two points there. And if and some types of windows need to be shimmed at the jams. Uh, think of a double hung window where you have that check rail between the where the upper sash and lower sash overlap. Well, that's a point load right there for those rotational forces that forces I was talking about. Because the sashes transfer the wind load right here. So thus the shim there at the halfway point. You might only really need to shim at the top and bottom just to square things up. But if you're going to have to shim there, you probably want a support bracket there. Otherwise, shimmy against a soft foam board isn't going to do you much good. You're not going to be able to move the window to square it up very easily against the foam board. So you're going to put down your support brackets. Then you're going to put your flashing tape, your sill flashing tape over the top of that. And then you're going to set your window and then you're going to have your watershed overlap flashings over the top of the nailing flange. And your installation is going to look like this when it's finished. Again, we have everything overlapped in watershed fashion from bottom to top, just like a roof. So one of the things you have to keep in mind if you're using something like a support bracket is this coordination of making sure that these support brackets are where I need to shim later on when I set the window. <coughs> so support brackets go in, then you cover them with flashing tape, and then you... Uh, to set your window and shim against them, basically. Any questions on that? All right, so um, the support bracket versus blocking, there's, there's pros and cons. Um, one advantage to using the support brackets is uh, thermally you don't have this continuous blocking around the opening that you've had to cut your insulation back to allow space for. So this is a thermal model. Uh, comparing the difference between having blocking around the opening versus running the insulation all the way to the opening. You can see there's a seven degree difference there at that uh, upper innermost point of the foam board 
Um, and that's really the thermal advantage to allowing your insulation to continue all the way to the opening versus cutting it back for blocking. Does that make sense? Now you do, of course, have at the points of the brackets a small thermal bridge, um, but because it's um, sparse and spaced, it makes very little impact on the thermal performance of the assembly. And also you're covering it with flashing tape, so you are creating a thermal break uh, as you cover it with flashing tape. Questions on that? All right, let's summarize then. Um, summarize where we've been, because we've been through a lot of content. So if you had half inch or three quarters insulation, you might be able to do just a standard install where your window could either be with your nailing flange, it could either be behind or to the exterior of the foam board. Even up to an inch, you might be able to install the window over the foam board without doing anything different because the window frame overlaps onto the framing enough to support it. Just make sure that your water resistor barrier or your building wrap is in line with your nail fin. And then when we get thicker, that's when uh, we need some, uh, some more complex strategies. I just mentioned the support bracket, which is a solution for an inch and a half or two inches of foam board thickness. You know, maybe there's some support brackets that could be produced for thicker foam boards. Um, but you're going to want to put your weather just a barrier to the exterior of your foam board, where your nailing fin is going to be in this case. Uh, metal trim or some type of return trim uh, works pretty well when you're holding the window back and you still need to cover that, uh, uh, that edge of the wall veneer and uh, insulation. And then, of course, we talked about blocking. That's really uh, the most common strategy people are using, but it might require you to transition your weather just a barrier from behind the foam to the surface of the blocking where your nail fin is, which is pretty complicated and very labor intensive. And then we talked about uh, different types of frame extensions. You can pre-install them or you can install them in the field. And then I also talked about the uh, receptor, which is really kind of its own installation method that allows you to uh, vary the placement of the window within the wall and install it from the interior. And really can work with or without foam board, but is certainly a strategy for uh, a foam board install. All right, some of the things I didn't really talk about very much was doors. So if you're going to install doors and you want to do a sort of an Audi installation where you move the door out, you really need to have blocking around that perimeter because doors have hinges and strikes and heavy panels, and those hinges need to be screwed into something solid, and that's typically blocking. Okay, so most of your, your variable options, at least for, for moving things out and not using blocking, is really in the window category, not the door category. There's a lot of variations out there, and some of them require multiple of these things to be used. So we've had projects where we've used receptors with extensions extruded onto them, or we've used um, well, a number of different things at the same time. Just depends on the, uh, the design constraints. Always think about thermal performance, but don't forget about installation sequencing, uh, keeping things simple. That's really the, the most important thing. Keep things as simple as possible. And then think about installation. Who's got to install this? Can it be installed? Exterior versus interior, is there access to do that? How heavy are the window combinations? Does that play into the installation method I want to choose? And then, usually I'm talking to architects uh, who are in practicing when I give this presentation. So I always suggest to them to work with their, uh, the window supplier and really all the, all the suppliers for the building envelope. And make sure that there is really a strategy that everybody agrees on that works with all the materials they're supplying that everybody will warrant at the end of the day, as opposed to coming up with something novel that nobody might like. Um, so yeah, that's really the key. And there's so much information online, especially if you guys are students, uh, to find out what's offered, what solutions are being done uh, and tried. Um, of course, your professors are a great resource, but there's a lot of information online and what folks offer as well. All right, I think we've covered all these things. We talked about the benefits of exterior insulation, uh, the requirements for window installation, a lot of variations in exterior assemblies, and then we talked about a couple of strategies uh, for how to do window and door installations the right way in foam board walls. So that concludes the presentation, except for your questions.
thank, thank you very much for your questions and interaction. I really appreciate that. Yeah, so before we leave, before I get to the swag, I did uh, um, forget, was remiss in mentioning that for those of you who are looking for AIA credits, see Lauren somewhere in here, where she is in the back. Uh, and for those of you who watch BCI credits, see me. <laughs> and you know, I spoke to the chancellor, so I got a special additional funds for us to be able to give out two bottles of this. Uh, you know, it took a lot of speaking and convincing. So we'd like to thank, thank not just Jaron, but also Dennis. Thank you very much for arranging this.